Hello and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Rosie Murphy. And I'm Sammy Roth, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We've reached Season 2, Episode 17, Lockdown. Last door map. Lock, Ben in the hatch, Saeed, Anna Lucia in the woods. And we've got uh, the first part of an interview with Jason Mattel, who is a professor of television and media studies at Middlebury College. He's going to tell us all about this term that he coined called the forensic fandom, which is basically about the night that we all spent trying to figure out what the blast door map meant. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. Let's get to it. As you probably know by now, we start every episode of The Hatch with our hot takes on the episode from the week. Sammy, what's your hot take? Ooh, okay. So I, I have what I think is an extremely hot take this week, which is, <laughs> which is not my usual uh, way of going about it. But um, Helen refusing to marry Locke and uh, breaking up with him on that spot there because mm-hmm. he was interacting with his father again, I, I just thought that was super cruel. Hmm. I didn't like that at all. I, I get that he lied to her. I get that he told her in the past that he was done with his father. But this is clearly like an extremely emotionally scarring part of Locke's life that he's having trouble dealing with. They've been together for a while. They seem really serious. They seem like they love each other. And the moment she finds out that his father is still alive and that Locke has interacted with him, you know, no chance for explanation, no chance to talk about it. She doesn't want to hear it. She's done. Goodbye. Didn't like that at all. Hmm. Okay. I thought that was unfair. I think that's a reasonable reaction. Um, I don't necessarily share it because I think I think what we see in the flashback is that John as Helen had basically given him ultimate given him an ultimatum to do in a previous flashback, right? Was it's it's him or me. Um mm-hmm. and you need to choose and the fact that they're still together implies that he chose Helen. And I guess my understanding was that that, that always stood like she knows that Anthony is kind of the thorn in John's side. And if he continues to have a relationship with Anthony, it's going to drain every other part of his life. And I think it's, it's mostly a, at least what we've seen in previous flashbacks, mostly like a, this, this is for your own good kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I guess, I mean, yeah, I don't know. The lie just kind of feels bigger this time because Anthony faked his death, which is a pretty big deal. You know, it's not like they, I mean, they went to his funeral. I know, but but I think for me, I mean, all of that's true, but I, I think for me, part of it is just the, you know, the clear emotional trauma to Locke of like, yeah. okay, he thinks it's over. He thinks his dad is dead. Yeah. And then suddenly he comes back. Like, not not that Locke doesn't own his actions here. Right. But the fact that Helen doesn't even, you know, like, give him a chance to try to explain or to let him talk about it. it she just has, you know, she has no interest in, in what's going on or why this happens. It's just like there was a line in the sand and that's it. Yeah. And I don't know. And that's, I, I think yeah. the, the thing that is fair about that is that because she set up this ultimatum, John can't tell her, like, hey, by the way, I found out my father's not really dead. Yeah. You know, she's set it up in such a way that if he does tell her, he's jeopardizing their relationship and that isolates him even further. So it does. I mean, it's it sucks. I I, I, I guess I I guess I get it. I I understand now why Helen was not in the church. Yeah. If if that was going to be the last straw for her, they were, you know, she was not the one to be in the church with him anyway. Um, (laughs) that was my hot take. What is yours? (laughs) Um, why is Jack suspiciously good at like every hobby they attempt in a subplot like he's really good at golf he's apparently really good at poker like i get it okay like oh doctors playing golf or like that could be a, a viable stereotype but and i you know he says he learned to play poker in phuket and this is where we get our first hint of jack's time in thailand but mm-hmm. J- jack just a prodigy at everything he attempts i was just shaking my head a little bit at that i am um... That's that's a hilarious observation. I, I, I did love how he played Sawyer. Well, I guess that's it. What do you mean, it? Sawyer, you're busted. I, I got it all. It wouldn't really be fair for you to go out and pick more mangoes. Well, I got a hell of a lot more mangoes. Want to play real steaks? Name them. It's a pile of fruit, man. And I want it back. Yeah, oh yeah, it's funny. I mean, the, it's like, because you know that he went in 
wanting to get the meds, but he he wouldn't bring it up himself, you know, until he absolutely right. had to. He was going to walk away, and he, he really baited Sawyer and made Sawyer think it was his idea. Oh, the whole thing is is a, is a poker face. The whole thing is a little <laughs> light con, right? Um, but no, it's super well done. It is. But it hinges oh, Jack. on Jack being unexpectedly good at poker. So... Go figure. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Cause, and, um, and better at poker than Sawyer, who you would expect to be the natural. Right. Artist. Right. Because poker is, you know, a game that's it's a based con on game. bluffing. Yeah. 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 Go figure. So let's uh, let's talk about Locke. Yeah. Locke and, and Henry is slash Ben. Um, oh, my God. Oh, gosh. It, this episode's fucking amazing. <laughs> um, I just want to... Shout out to the construction of this episode. Like, hmm. the the writers are giving us this excellent bait and switch by making Henry Gale seem better and better and more and more real throughout the episode. Like, he helps John when he doesn't have to. He, You're going to think he's escaped, and then he comes back um, to see the thing through with John, and they almost seem to be becoming friends. And then in the forest, Sawyer and Anna Lucia find his balloon, and it seems like it's going to be real until the very end. I know. Oh, it's brilliant. And also, like, thank goodness Saeed was so tenacious. My gosh. His, right? His line. Your whole story, your alibi, it was true. But still, I did not believe it to be true. So I dug up that grave. Oh, my goodness. Chills. Just chills. Yep. Yep. Because he was, he ended up being right, which is the the thing that, you know, you know, turns this from like a a sort of a grief fueled obsession into like holy shit, he was he was right, and thank goodness he was. Um, yeah. Fascinating. Oh my God, you know, I after Michael Emerson told us how he did the thing where he tried not to move very much and like keep his face very still. Yeah, I keep seeing he, that everywhere. That that face he has at the end where he's been caught, where it's like. Really, he just kind of doesn't do anything. He just mm-hmm. stares, but it's so perfect. Yeah. <laughs> do you think Locke... So when, when, when Ben says, you know, that... Uh, when when Locke says, uh, you know, opens the door to the armory because he needs Ben's help and asks mm-hmm. him again, you know, who are you? And Ben tells him again, you know, I'm Henry Gale. I'm from Minnesota. I crashed here just like you. And then Locke lets him out to help. Do you think Locke really believes him now finally? Or do you just think, like, he needs his help? And so he's going to let him out either way. I think he's he's going to let him out either way. Mm. But I think he... I think we see him move over the course of the episode closer and closer to belief. I mean, I think he asks... Mm. There's no real point in asking Henry then who he is, because of course he's going to say I'm Henry. You know, it's not like he's going to say, oh, I've been lying this whole time. Yeah. Um. So he's, I don't think at that point he's sure, but I think, I think Henry, and I'm going to call him Henry for purposes of this episode, <laughs> I think he proves himself. Um, you know, he, he admits to Locke that he tried the grate in the armory and it didn't open. Um, then he climbs through the other grate and, and goes and pushes the button and, you know, asks his usual amount of kind of circumspect questions, but isn't too aggressive with it. And he does seem when Locke is trapped under the blast door, genuinely interested in saving him, you know, yeah. he's, he's moving fast enough that it seems sort of instinctual. It doesn't seem like he's calculating, although we know Ben is a very fast thinker, but <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think by the end of this episode had, had Saeed not walked in when he did, I think Locke would have vouched for him. I think you're right, and I think that I mean there was a part of me watching this episode thinking, gee, if if Saeed didn't dig up the body and and um, realize he was lying at the end, like Ben would have been in such a good position at the end of this episode, having oh, yeah. built up Locke's trust. Like, who knows what he would have been able to accomplish? Yeah, they might have I let mean, him out. They might have let him join society. Yeah, or at least he, at least he's on his road to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, we we talked a lot the last couple of weeks about you know what is what is Ben's end game here? How is he going to get out? But I, now I'm kind of thinking like, gee, what what would he have ended up doing if they had just accepted him eventually? Yeah, that's an interesting kind of thought experiment. Like, how long would he have stayed? 
because he he's king other i mean he's got to go back at some point <laughs> right um yeah what would and his we know that, be and we know that he needs jack to operate on him oh does he know that at this point yeah, yeah, he knows okay. that. He 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 got the diagnosis from Juliet the um the day the morning of the plane crash That's before right. the plane showed up. That's right. So I just wonder, you know, like would would there have been some whole other strategy here where he mm-hmm. would have been able to, you know, convince Get... Jack to come and help him right. without the whole putting Kate and Sawyer in a cage deal. Right. I don't know. I don't know either. C- can we also talk about the flashback for a minute? Of course. In addition to my being rude to Helen earlier, <laughs> um, I one the the one big question that I had here, and it's you know it's a pretty straightforward flashback in a lot of ways. Anthony Cooper is terrible and continues to be terrible. Um, but there's that moment when they're in the motel together at the end, Locke and his dad, and Locke won't take the money, and Locke yeah. says, "I didn't do it for the money." Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? If if he didn't do it for the money, then why did he do it? Well, I, I mean, I think he did it. I I have in my contemporaneous notes from the episode, does John do it for Anthony or does he do it for the money? And then I wrote, well, that gets answered. Um, <laughs> okay. The thing is, so, I mean, I think we're meant to believe here that he does it out of either a sense of duty to his father or a desire to prove himself to his father one last time. Hmm. Um kind of like a, a last ditch attempt to to win him over and to have that relationship that he hoped to have when they were hunting goyal together on the weekends and stuff um but i i don't know if he would have done it without the money because when anthony asks to meet him and says i need your mm. help john doesn't want to hear it initially right and then, yeah, that's true. And then he introduces the money. And then Anthony element. says, "I'll give you two hundred grand." And John says, "Well, okay." Um, so I don't, I don't know that. I, I don't know. I think we could go either way on this because I don't think he would have done it prior to being promised the money. But once he is promised the money, I think he s- continues and and gets through it out of a sense of duty um, or you know a sense of trying to that's to please his father or win him over. Um, yeah, I, because that's that's what I was thinking about as well. The you know, uh, still desperately trying to to bond with his father, but I, I, I just like there was a part of me that just really didn't want to believe that to me to be true because it's so yeah. awful. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you're Especially right. Especially since at the funeral, I mean, John seems to be doing okay. Yeah, I mean, John seems probably glad he's gone. Yeah, this door is closed. You know, he's got whatever closure he's going to get, but then it's not. Yeah. I know we talked about this last time Anthony Cooper showed up, but, like, I'm so looking forward to when he dies. Oh, he sucks. More than any character on the <laughs> show, he deserves a terrible death. He's probably the most unequivocally bad character on the show. Oh, 100%. But, yeah, no, I mean, it, the the flashback it really is quite sad, just because it makes John seem so pitiful. Like, yeah, you know, part of me in watching this was like, John, good lord, like... This man stole Same. a kidney from you. Like, get Same. out of the car, whatever he's promising you. And I think as a general rule, once someone steals your kidney, you should just not, you know, work with that person. Yeah, again. absolutely. That's a that's a block <laughs> number situation. Um. <laughs> no, it, it it is. And it's just, again, such a, it's so crazy to see this contrast between the lock as we know him then versus the lock on the island. Right, right. It really underscores his transformation. Um yeah not just sort of the physical miracle, right, that where he can walk again, but... But the sense of purpose and direction. Yeah. Yeah. Which and we're now going sad. to see him lose over the next couple of weeks, by the way. <laughs> right, right. And, Sorry, but it is, uh, it is sad yeah. to see him in every... I think in every flashback, or in a lot of the flashbacks, we see John working a different, really sad job. You know, he's he works yeah. for the box company, and he's he works at that toy store for a bit, and he's a home inspector, and um, yeah, really, really just digs into that point of purposelessness. Yeah. Well, do you have any hindsight? Yeah, just the the nice little Easter egg of of John inspecting the home that Nadia's just bought. Um, oh, Nadia, where she says, "I don't have a husband." 
and you just mm-hmm. feel a little pang of, oh, what might have been? Oh, well, she will have a husband eventually, and, and then she'll die. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, Nadia. <laughs> Thank you, fortune teller. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Andrea Gabriel, who uh, who we had on the hatch uh, last year. Oh, yeah. Go back Nadia. and listen to the early part of season one. Yeah, she's um, she's cool. She's fun. <laughs> Would you have anything in hindsight? <laughs> um, yeah, just um, I just wanted to to say that I, I, I was having trouble remembering this episode, what it is that actually triggers the lockdown. Oh, yeah. So I so I went on Lostpedia and lo and behold, we never find out what triggers a lockdown. I was wondering about that. We know that that Desmond and Kelvin and Redzinski before them knew how to manually trigger one, but right. in terms of what causes an actual lockdown, like we saw this episode, there's there's not really an answer. Right, because all we hear the weird static coming through the speakers, and then it just happens, right? Yeah, the the one the one thing on Lostpedia that sort of seems like they had in the show is a hint is that. Apparently, one of the many notes on the blast door map says activity minimal during lockdown and restocking procedures. Oh, and then we do we do find that there's been a delivery of Dharma food, right? Yeah, the pallet drop. So perhaps uh, those two things have something to do with each other. Uh, unclear, but but possibly. Well, That's, um, speaking of on that note, yeah, yeah. So, um, I had the 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 great pleasure of having this conversation with Dr. Jason Mattel, who, as we mentioned, is a professor of film and television and media studies uh, at Middlebury College. He was very involved with Lostpedia in its early days, like around season two, Uh, but we'll get into that more another time. So today we're going to focus on um, an essay he wrote between the third and fourth seasons of Lost, which in which he basically argues that um, shows that fans like uh, are, are sort of worthy of a scholarly exploration of what makes fans like these shows. Uh, so he came up with what he calls these four aesthetic norms, four things that Lost does uh, that kind of kind of make us like it so much. And you talk about the blast door map. Yes, also that. All right, let's do it. So in in around the time of season three, as I understand it, you wrote this essay. Uh, it's called Lost in a Great Story, if anybody wants to look it up. Um, and in this, you lay out these four aesthetic norms that you argue make Lost not just great, television not just fun to watch but actually a great work deserving of the scholarly treatment the other thing i wanted to argue was that television scholars should actually ask these questions Mm. you know why is this a great show what is this show doing that's distinct aesthetically um and that was not a question that a lot of tv scholars were invested in at the time and still it's one that that people are are, uh there there are um debates about Uh. academic Love to debate about these things, right? Sure. So what I was trying to do is, is set up some criteria mm-hmm. that we can uh, make sense of it. So yeah, as you mentioned, I, I lay out four categories. Um, so the first, in, in the essay I called Unity of Purpose. Yeah, uh, and I, I just want to say, when I read this essay, these made intuitive sense to me. Like, I, I, I recognized these in my experience of watching Lost as a viewer, but it was it was really neat to see them sort of named and categorized, um, which is why I think this is a useful conversation but continue please yeah thank you um so unity of purpose where like in in retrospect i might call it um unity of design um, okay than purpose because purpose suggests like there's some intent that the creators are going for which i think there is but i also think that it's it's really muddled because television is collaborative and there are certainly episodes that are that don't fit with this unity um, because they're, you know, they're different authors involved or for whatever reason they didn't deliver. And, and, and I think that's fine. You know, television doesn't have to bat a thousand to be great. But, um, but I think the idea that was distinct about lost um, and that really uh, made it in my mind uh, different from most of the other shows and certainly most network shows was the sense of there is a design at play. Mm. And that doesn't necessarily mean like, Oh, the creators knew from the very beginning how it all was going to come together. They didn't. Right. And I think that's okay. But rather they created the show to um, define its its own unity as it went, that everything flowed from what came before it. Mm-hmm. And that sense of unity 
which is a you know a very traditional aesthetic norm that yeah. we we attribute to art in you know a, a wide range of form. I think that Lost did that in a way that was not typical of most television. At best, I would say most television prior to this era maybe had unity within a season. Mm. The sense of okay, this season is designed to lead up to this. Um, a, a great example of that is uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, mm -hmm. which is an important predecessor to Lost and uh, fits with a lot of these ideas. Um, each season was structured in a way that it felt like, oh yeah, this is leading up to the final confrontation with the big bad. These right. are the themes of the season. These are the issues at play. Um, but there wasn't a sense that I mean, most people got was, there's a seven season plan in which these all all these things come together. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. I think that wasn't trying to do that. Lost, I think, was doing that, even though there wasn't a plan, it was acting as if there were huh. a plan. And, and and I find that compelling. Yeah. And why do you think that feels rewarding to a viewer? Like, why is that something that appeals to us that is aesthetically pleasing? I think so much of uh, the way in which we engage with narrative is an imagined uh, interplay between the consumer, whether it's mm. a reader or a viewer, and the creator. Mm. And there's a sense that I find, and I do this, I know a lot of people do this, not everyone, but I think a lot of people do this uh, approach where we, we ask ourselves in our mind, what is he or she or they, the creators, mm -hmm. uh, trying to do here and oh wow i didn't predict that that mm -hmm. they were going to do that or oh i think i know what they're going to do yeah it's not exactly a game but there's a sense of reflection that we have in thinking about the the storytelling process mm -hmm. in which we're imagining the storyteller making choices and then sometimes trying to predict what those choices right. are and sometimes trying to uh, anticipate what the choices might be mm -hmm. um, and engage in that interplay. Yeah, and that that's something that goes beyond what do you have for me this week, the serialized format. And I think another key aspect of this is television is very much uh, – has been, and it's changing to some degree with the rise of, uh, of uh, Netflix and other mm -hmm. forms where an entire season drops at once, right? right? But – in its traditional form where it's a weekly thing, it becomes very ritualistic. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense of, okay, I am going to watch my show mm -hmm. this week at this time, and I'm going to engage in this interplay with right. the show. And the sense of satisfaction that you get when this, when things come together mm -hmm. in a way that you're like, wow, I can't believe they did that. Right. Well, and I think this this ties in really nicely to the second of these aesthetic norms that you talk about, which is the forensic fandom, yeah. which, I, I mean, absolutely was part here of the are. lost experience. Yeah, here we are 15 years later. <laughs> so this concept of forensic fandom is a, is a term that I coined because it really uh, spoke to what I saw um, a lot of television fans doing in this era mm -hmm. in the 2000s, um, but Lost, I think, was the, the uh, pinnacle of this. This idea that um, viewers aren't just watching and turning off the TV over the course of the week, the gaps between episodes or the gaps between seasons. And one of the main ways that they were trying to engage, or we were, because I was one of them, was trying to answer questions, mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what is happening in the show, what theories do I have to explain what is happening, what is this little moment that I see here, how does this play into um, this uh, this larger experience? And they were, of course, doing it in a, in a new context because mm -hmm. this was the first, you know, it's not like the internet was born in 2004, obviously it right. wasn't, but... <laughs> But this was the first show that really tapped into this platform of active engagement that allowed mm -hmm. for fans to collaborate in real time across the world. Right. Um, there wasn't a sense of it being a very, you know, participating in a fan discussion board or a mm -hmm. wiki was not seen as a radical fringe that only a few people would do. Yeah. 
you know, if you go back to a show like Twin Peaks, the original Twin Peaks in 1990 and 91, there's a, you know, there's interesting uh, articles that were written in the 90s about how Usenet uh, mm -hmm. bulletin board readers were at, obsessed with Twin Peaks. Right. Um, and, <laughs> you know, but that's a tiny number of people. Right. Like that was not the mainstream way that Twin Peaks was conceived, uh, consumed. Whereas I think that not the majority of Lost fans, but a, a very significant group of Lost fans um, consumed the show in a way that was uh, tied into this participatory culture online. Yeah. And, and the main way that they did it, not the exclusive way, but the main way that they were doing it was through this puzzle solving, mm -hmm. this uh, theorizing, this attempt to make sense of things, this mm -hmm. forensic impulse. And how much of something that just came to mind was I think this is also around the time that TiVo was coming out or the technology yes. to record and rewatch and yes. pause. And yeah, this was huge. Yeah. So, so in the, if, if we're looking at this era, like, like I said, like 1999 to 2004, mm -hmm. you know, you have this shift in the industry where shows can have fewer viewers and still be considered successful. Right. You also have this shift in technology mm -hmm. and that you had um, two ways of consuming a show without being beholden to the network schedule. Mm -hmm. One was DVRs, mm -hmm. um, TiVo, the brand name, um, but I, I believe that TiVo came out in 2000 and became fairly widespread. A lot of people had DVRs by the time Lost came on. Yeah, yeah. And watching Lost on a DVR is a totally different experience mm -hmm. than watching it live broadcast because you can pause, you can rewind and say, well, what does that say? Pause on the and blast door map and just look at every, yeah. Exactly. Um, or, you know, one of my favorite moments in the series is um, in the episode orientation mm -hmm. where, you know, um, Jack and Locke find the orientation film mm -hmm. in the bunker and they watch it and they learn you know, it's our first exposure to the Hanso, mm -hmm. Hanso Foundation. And they watch it and the line that comes afterwards is John Locke saying, we're going to have to watch that again. Yep. That's the forensic fandom right there. Like John Locke is the forensic <laughs> fan in the show. Um, and he becomes obsessed with trying to solve these answers. Right. And we are as well. Right. So when I watched that, you know, I watched it the night it, that it first aired, but I was watching on my DVR. Right. So I watched that. He says, we're going to have to watch that again. Cut to commercial break. And I said, I'm watching that again. <laughs> so I rewound and rewatched that a couple of times yeah. before going on. That's not a mode of viewing that most that historically has been available to most people. Right. Most people watched network television when it aired. Mm -hmm. Um the other technology, which we take for granted now, but was still fairly um, distinct in the early 2000s, was the idea that a television show would be released on DVD. Mm. The DVD comes out a few months before the new season mm -hmm. comes out, and then people are re-watching it and pouring over it, looking at the extras. Yeah. The extras had a lot of little breadcrumbs yeah. for extra stuff in it. And, you know, so that becomes this, you know, the the forensic text is expanded through these uh, through these technologies. Mm -hmm. The other two you mentioned are narrative complexity and the operational aesthetic. Yeah. And what are those so, and how does Lost use them? Yeah. Um, so the um, this concept of the operational aesthetic, which is kind of a, you know, academic jargon. Yeah. Basically what it means is pleasure and, in, and uh, engagement with the operation of something, mm. the way that something works. So the, the term was coined by a cultural historian named uh, Neil Harris, writing about P.T. Barnum, the, mm. you know, the um, circus. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what he was saying was that Barnum, a lot of what Barnum did was he had these side, you know, this sort of mm -hmm. sideshow to the circus where he would present these sort of mysterious machines mm. or like these sort of semi mystical not exactly magic tricks, but rather they were kind of uh, displays that's, that were weird and inexplicable. Yeah. And Harris says that, that what Barnum did was he was able to make people think about the way, not just saying, wow, that's, that's impressive, the aesthetics of the magic trick, but people would also engage with the aesthetics of how does this work? And they would try to make sense of the machine. Hmm. And this, this idea of making sense of the machine is 
I think really important to the way that a lot of television shows work, and I think lost probably more than any, that viewers are not simply watching the show to try to make sense of the story, mm -hmm. the story work. We were also trying to make sense of the storytelling, huh. right? So like, how is this story told becomes a really important vector of our experience. Um, there are individual episodes that are, I think, dedicated to um, playing with the way that a story is told in which the, the experience of the mm -hmm. episode is being surprised or engaged by that storytelling. Can you does an, do you have an example at the top of your mind? Sure. So um, expose. Is oh it, is it, yes. <laughs> right. So that's um, the sort of infamous episode with Nikki and Paolo, yes. and you know, as you're watching that episode, do you really care about Nikki and Paolo as characters? Not so right. much. What you care about is how do they fit into the story that we have seen? So one of the pleasures of that episode is seeing scenes that we've already seen previously throughout you know the season yeah. series, really, and imagining, oh, Nikki and Paolo were there and like seeing it from a different mm -hmm. perspective. And when I watched that episode, and certainly a lot of the fans at the time, it was trying to make sense of, does this cohere? Does this mm. come together? Does it change our understanding of what happened? Yeah. But also, does it change our understanding of how these stories are told? Hmm. And for people who were invested in the fan community, Nick, uh, Nikki and Paolo were a direct result of um, fans kind of lobbying Damon and Carlton saying, we want to know about the other 40 some odd people who are on right, this island. Right. And, you know, so there are a bunch of extras right. and sometimes the, the extras are, uh, get speaking parts and we get to know a little bit about yeah. them. Or they get a two episode uh, arc and then they get killed or. Yeah. Parts, yeah. You know, is yeah, exactly. Example. Um, but more often than not, they're just extras. Mm -hmm. So expose was, uh, you know, an episode that was predicated on this, idea of might the other people who we don't know anything about have interesting stories going on and what would happen if we shifted our attention to them over the course of an episode and of course what happened was they um they had been you know so putting nikki and paulo in the background of episodes throughout season three yeah as a way to um open up that possibility here yeah, are two at one point they get names and at yep. one point they come along on one of john Locke's little quests and exactly yeah and what what um damon and carlton said was we were trying to expand the character base hmm. part of this was because they they had to at that point they didn't know when the show was going to end they were like oh the best way to do tap dancing is to bring in new characters but you can't bring in new characters on a desert island right without some major plot event. Right. So let's go ahead and expand the role of the extras. So they were trying to do that. But then what they realized after a couple of episodes was, this is not very interesting, you know? And this kind of pulls away from what we really care about, which is our core characters. Right, and it was very polarizing. Yeah. Among the there fans. Were who were like, why are you talking about these these people? Right. <laughs> very much a meta story about yeah. like how we try to tell interesting stories about people's background, how it totally fails, and then we just kind of bury them alive. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and literally, we, we don't kill them, we just bury them. Right. And um, so I think that that episode really makes sense, primarily if you are um, – paying attention to not just the story, what's happening on the island, but the storytelling. Mm. How does this show try to tell its stories? Mm. And and very much that fans were engaged with that, you yeah. know, trying to make sense of um, how is the show going to tell its stories? And then I think the, so, so that's an example that's somewhat polarizing and, you know, playful and meta. I think the example from Lost that in, in my mind is, is the greatest uh, sort of, what I call a narrative special effect is um, the uh, uh, the end end of season three through the looking glass. Through the looking glass. Yeah, that's where so, we get the first flash forward, right? We've been exactly. flashing back for three seasons, and exactly. Yeah. And again, like that episode, it's it's a trick, right? Yeah. The it's designed in a way that you think bearded Jack is a flashback to another moment in his history right. that we haven't seen before. We just don't know yet. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, but then it turns out he knows Kate and yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I remember very vividly that experience of watching that episode and the season in the scene where Kate drives up and talks to Jack Mm -hmm. and it's clear that they have already been to the island. Yeah. And they're outside the airport and it's, Oh, and, you know, in that episode, and, and there's this rush of, yeah. oh, my God, right? <laughs> and that's the operational aesthetic, right? Uh-huh. Like, that's not because, oh, I can't believe that Jack and Kate know each other in the future. Like, in the story, it's not very interesting. Mm-hmm. But at the level of storytelling, I can't believe we're seeing a flash forward. Right. I, you know, and that sense of surprise um, and being uh, – really um, overwhelmed by the way in which the storytelling has taken us and transported us. Um, th- that to me is like the, the pure operational aesthetic and something mm-hmm. that lost when it worked, it worked so well. Mm-hmm. And, um, and this fits into this larger paradigm of what I call narrative complexity, mm-hmm. which is just this idea that using a wide range of um of narrative mechanics like flash forwards, flashbacks, parallel universes, um, the ability to sort of change perspectives from any given episode so that you see the same thing from different people's perspectives. Mm-hmm. You know, all, all of these mechanisms are part of uh, this uh, mode of complexity that I think Lost really um, wasn't the only show that, that worked on, but was one of the main ones. Um, um, I, I guess we kind of alluded to some of this in, you know, forensic fandom and talking about the blast door map, but was lockdown a specific, unique experience of that kind of forensic fandom or, or what made lockdown special in your mind? Yeah. So lockdown for me was distinctive. And again, it was because of a, uh, a nice moment of serendipity. Mm. I was watching the episode, um, not quite real time because I had a DVR, but you know, within the half hour specials, and then we come to the black blast door map, and I, uh, you know, there's that scene where Locke is trapped, and, mm-hmm. and we see it oh so briefly on screen, and I'm watching on a DVR, so of course I rewind and try to freeze frame and try to see anything, and I can't make sense of it. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll just look afterwards. So I would finish watching the whole episode, and then I go online, and I start searching to see what people are saying about it to to make sense of it. And I found a bunch of fan forums where people are posting images Mm -hmm. of the Blast Door map and um, trying to make sense of it. And then, like, as I spend, you know, some time doing this, and then I have to go do something, you know, in the house, I come back to it and go back there. And I see that people have started annotating them. Mm. So I, so then I was like, Oh, this is interesting. And this is as I'm starting to develop my ideas about forensic fandom. So I start taking screenshots. So for me, it was a great example because I happened to be there to document it. So I have screenshots of one fan community annotating the map Mm -hmm. from sort of like time of air one hour, two hours, eight hours, 24 hours. By the time you get to 24 hours, this one group of fans had not only been able to um, get every word and symbol that's on the map, but they had translated the Latin <laughs> on the map. And so like, you had that's a remarkable. full realization. So what I thought was really interesting about this was, you know, clearly this is a, a moment where – no individual person could have done that, right? Because mm-hmm. you know there was a couple of people who had expertise in terms of photo manipulation yeah. in order to get the image more crisp and more right. Legible. Because we don't get a clear, straight-on shot of it. Yeah. yeah. And the and uh, the lighting, because of the blue light or black light um, effect, is really hard to read. Mm-hmm. So like the, you know there were fans yeah. who went ahead and stripped the color of it, and you know like you know you have a Photoshop expert who basically comes up with the ideal render of this Mm -hmm. right and then you have people who know latin and they go ahead and do the translation and you know so you have a a team of people who are bringing their expertise together Mm -hmm. and this is a concept that some you know theorists of digital media have called collective intelligence Hmm. the idea that a community knows more than individual members do Mm -hmm. right and when you work together you come up with these things so here was a case of fan collective intelligence and it wasn't just this one site i documented five different sites where people within a day had 
really fleshed out everything and then started to try to interpret and make right. sense of, okay, so it says this, but what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing for me was that week in Entertainment Weekly, which was the magazine that was most lost obsessive yeah. um, and had a best, had a very close relationship with the producers. Mm -hmm. So what happened was the producers knew that fans were going to obsess about this map. So they went ahead and had a image of the map published in Entertainment Weekly with some annotations, not fully mm -hmm. annotated. But the idea was to say, we're going to give you some answers here. Mm -hmm. By the time that was published, the fans had already figured out much more than what they had done, <laughs> right? And I asked the producers about that, and they said, yes, we assumed that this would be a very slow process. Right. They were totally taken aback with the idea that fans could solve this puzzle in an you know a day, right. which was quite remarkable. So for me, it's a great example of how the producers – are designing narrative experiences for viewers, not just to sort of be immersed in the story, but give them little puzzles and games mm -hmm. to play with. Um, Lockdown is not, I think, unique, but mm -hmm. I think it is a, a sort of the peak example of what fans could do and just really try to set up opportunities for them mm -hmm. to try to make sense of these things. So I found this interview fascinating. Um, oh, I'm so glad. And there were and there were a couple a couple things he said that just like immediately made sense to me like oh that mm. that's such a perfect explanation for you know something that i enjoyed about lost like yeah like the point he made about how it was compelling even though they didn't really have a plan that the fact that they acted like they had a plan yeah made for compelling viewing i just thought that rung so true mhm mm yeah well and in kind of the converse to that i really enjoyed his point about how part of the reason fans hated expose so much was that it broke from that norm. Hmm. And, and part of our discomfort with it was like, what, what are they doing here? What's the show doing? This isn't lost. Um, yeah. And it was the fact that they changed the mechanism of the storytelling that really got under our skin, which is interesting. And I'll be thinking about that when we do watch expose next year. Anyway, we're, so we, we've got, um, we've got more from, from Jason over the next couple of weeks. That's correct. Uh, in the meantime, we always welcome your thoughts, your comments, etc. We're at facebook.com slash the hatch podcast and on Twitter at the hatch podcast. Please uh, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever you listen to the hatch. Uh, we, we appreciate it and it helps people find the show. Uh, next week we will be watching Dave. A um, bit of an odd episode, but it should be fun to talk about and revisit. As always, our cover art is by Danny Roth, and our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen. Talk to you next week. Namaste. Namaste.